So today, I would like to pray for you as we come into the message. Uh, let, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to your word knowing that your word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Your word comes into our hearts and onto our lives to change us, to grow us. And I thank you, Father God, for your word working in us. And as we come to the word of God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will make it alive, will make it powerful, will help us understand even more who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Well, uh, today I would like to share with you how to navigate during a storm. And I would say that we are in a storm right now. The entire world is in the middle of a storm. And I, I found a Bible uh, story that, in fact, several days ago was just quickened to my heart by the Holy Spirit. And I knew instantly when this came to my mind that I needed to share it with you today. And the story is found in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 14. So if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, I'd like to share a couple of things with you out of this. Because right now with the coronavirus that's happening and everybody is on, on lockdown and things are taking place, things aren't going normal, and people are concerned about their job, they're concerned about their business, they're concerned about toilet paper, they're concerned about food, all kinds of concerns. We're in the middle of a storm. And I would like to share with you how you can navigate through this storm. The storm wasn't caused by you, but God knew the storm was coming. And God already has a plan for you to navigate through it. So starting in Matthew chapter 14, the first thing that happens in chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, I just want to highlight those verses for you. What happens is John the Baptist, who is the cousin of Jesus, who was a friend of Jesus, who is extremely important to Jesus, gets beheaded. So Jesus has his personal storm. The first thing that happens is Jesus goes through a storm, and the storm that he goes through is the loss of a loved one, the loss of a friend, the loss of a relative, the loss of someone that's really important. In fact, Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah coming before him and declaring the way of the Lord. Jesus also said about John the Baptist that he was the greatest prophet that had ever lived. So he considered John the Baptist the most important prophet of the entire Old Testament. And I'm not sure if you realize, even though John's story is in the New Testament, he lived under the Old Testament covenant. And he's an extremely important person for Jesus, and he paved the way for Jesus to come. Well, when Jesus found out that John uh, the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod, it really hurt him. And so um, here's what happens. We pick the story up in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a desert place by himself, but went. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. So Jesus got into boat. He went across the sea, but they heard where he was. And so a large group of people started walking around the lake to get where Jesus was. And it says in verse 14, when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. Here's what I'd like you to, to understand. The first thing that Jesus did during his personal storm is he didn't blame God. He didn't get mad at God. He didn't say, God, why did you let John the Baptist die? He didn't say, why was he beheaded? He went to prayer. He went to a, a to be alone and have a time of prayer. So Jesus, in his personal storm, he went to a place of prayer. And then when he was done praying, look what happens. He comes out of that place wherever he was, this desolate place, this desert place, this place where nobody was. Uh, it's not a village. It's not a city. He was just out on his own. So he could have been, like for you, it would have been at maybe a park. It would have been someplace else, out at the beach or at the desert or in the mountains. It really doesn't matter. But when Jesus left that place of prayer, he saw all these people, and it says, and it doesn't say he got mad at them, he had compassion on them. And it says right here that he had compassion, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. The thing that God wants to do during a storm is heal people. He wants people to be whole, he wants people to be well. Verse 15 says this, 
When it was evening, so he had done this all day, praying for people all day, healing people all day. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. And Jesus said, do, uh, he said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Listen real close. Jesus comes out of his personal storm. He comes and sees all these people. He starts praying for them. And then the disciples are encouraging him, send all the people away because we don't have any food to feed them and they need to go eat. And he said, you feed them. And, they, and he said, well, how are we going to feed them? He said, what do you have? They said, we have, uh, we have five loaves and these two fish. And he said, bring them to me. And what he did at that moment is he blessed them. Now listen, the story changes really fast right here. And most people don't see this change. Most people don't realize what Jesus is doing at this very moment and how quickly this story changes. And he says, bring them here to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and, gr and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples gave it to the multitudes. Jesus said, let's look at what we have. What do we have during the storm? And let's give thanks for it. Jesus gave thanks over and over and over. He gave thanks. When he was raising someone from the dead, he gave thanks. When he was, when he was healing the sick, he gives thanks. When he fed the, these people, he gave thanks. And it says that there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Well, there could have been anywhere from 12 to 20,000 people at this moment, depending on how many kids were there, how many women were there. Well, the only thing we know is there were 5,000 men. And he fed all of them. And then they had leftovers afterwards. Look what happens now. Go down to verse uh, 20. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, they had just eaten. They had just picked up all the baskets. They just picked up all the food. And remember, this is evening. This is dinner. It's not lunch. This is dinner. They're having dinner. And look at verse 22, and here's where the story changes. Immediately. 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 What's immediately, immediately mean to you? It means right now. Jesus changed his, his demeanor and says this, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side. He sent the multitudes away. That little tiny verse changes this story drastically. Here's what happened. Jesus knew that a storm was coming and he knew that his disciples had to get to the other side of the lake before the storm got really bad. And he immediately, he made them, he forced them into a boat. Somehow Jesus changed his demeanor and he told his team, get in the boat and get out of here. Jesus stayed. And when they got in the boat and got out of there, they started to cross the, the sea and a storm hit them. Now, if they had delayed any longer, then he, they wouldn't have been able to even get to where they were. They were not, Jesus was now teaching his disciples how to navigate during a storm. Most of you know the story and what's coming up where the disciples have this massive, massive storm that they're in the middle and Jesus finally walks on water to come to them. But before we get to that, let's just look at it in detail. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Get to the other side is what he told them. He goes, I want you on the other side. Go now. There are times in during the storm where God is telling you to do something now and he doesn't want you to delay. And one of the ways that you navigate through the storm is listening to the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit telling you? What is the Holy Spirit impressing on your heart? What is the Holy Spirit saying to do? Is the Holy Spirit saying, call so-and-so, email so-and-so, get a hold of so-and-so. Why don't you text so-and-so? They just need to hear your voice right now. They just need to know that they're not alone. Right now, with people all over the whole state confined to their homes, people are feeling alone. They're feeling by themselves. Right now is a great time to reach out to all of your friends and, and, your, and your neighbors and just connect with them and say, hey, I'm thinking about you. You're not alone. Jesus immediately made them get in the boat and leave. 
Now Jesus stays with, the, with all the people, the whole crowd. Now remember, there's close to 20,000 people. And Jesus, by himself, disperses the crowd. Tells them, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go. So look what, what takes place now. His, his team is in a boat, and they're headed across the sea. And the sea is about four miles long. It's, it's, they're traveling about four miles. It should take them about two hours in that boat to get that four miles, at the very most, about two hours. And look what takes place now, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. So he had gone up to the mountain all by himself to pray, and it's now into the nighttime. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea. They had only traveled about two miles, and they have traveled about two miles in almost six hours. They have been in the storm for a while now. Look what happens. Now, when the evening came, he was alone, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The fourth, notch, fourth watch of the night is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And they're only in the middle of the sea. And they have been there for probably six to seven hours in the middle of the sea, take, just to get the two miles that they have crossed so far. Jesus now comes walking on the water. First of all, that is like, wow, how do you walk on water? It's a symbol that Jesus is walking right in the middle of the storm. Because what you need to realize, this isn't Jesus' storm. He had it previously with John the Baptist. This storm is the disciples' storm. Whatever storm you're going through, God himself will send his son to walk right on top of the storm. Jesus walking on the water with the wind blowing and the waves blowing because the wind is going to cause these massive waves. And it was known on the Sea of Galilee that this, the, the weather can change drastically from being calm to being very, very windy and being very dangerous at that time. So Jesus now walks as a symbol that God will walk right on top of coronavirus to say, I have authority over it. I have authority over your financial storm. I have authority over all your storms. God is walking through the presence of Jesus on top of your storm. Whatever storm you're going through, God is making sure that he is walking right through it to get to you. But look what happens. Now, it says in, in verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now, that's a normal reaction. If you were out in the boat and there's wind blowing everywhere, and all of a sudden you saw a man walking on top of the water. Let's say you're halfway to Catalina Island from Newport, and you saw somebody walking. That would be frightening. I mean, that's something that's never happened before. And so look what takes place. And it says, and they were afraid. But immediately in the middle of their storm, in the middle of their storm, immediately, there's that word again, immediately, Jesus changes again. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. Do you know how many people are frightened deep in their soul right now of coronavirus? Most of the world is scared. Most of the world is just in panic mode. Jesus is walking on top of the coronavirus, walking on top of the storm, walking to you and saying, it's me. Be of good cheer. How many people do you know right now are, you would classify as good cheer, that they're full of cheer? Well, you've got people here. We only have a small group of people here because of the limitation. I think we have like eight people here right now just to make sure we can get this live streaming. Well, Josh and Angela, Suzette and myself are here. And the four of us, guess what? We're of good cheer. We are full of cheer because we believe in Jesus and we believe that he's walking on this storm and he's coming to you with your answer. 
And that you need to now be thinking of him and you need not, not to be afraid. God is not bringing fear to you. The enemy is bringing fear to you. God is bringing you the answer in the middle of the storm. For you to navigate in the middle of the storm, you need to be looking to Jesus and nothing else. You need to look to him and what is he saying to you? What are the promises of the word of God saying to you? What is he declaring to you? And, and when he says, don't be afraid. Now, he didn't say, don't be afraid. He said, be of good cheer and don't be afraid. And it's time for us to be of good cheer. So at the end of this message, we're going to have communion. And we're going to have communion to be of good cheer, to be full of joy because we serve our God. We don't serve the government. We don't serve this world. We serve Jesus Christ. And he said, be of good cheer and be not afraid. Then look what ha happens. And Peter answered him, said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Well, the first thing he'd already heard his voice. He already declared, it is me. He already said, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. So now Peter is doubting the answer to a storm. Prove to me that you're really caring. And you know what? You don't need to tell God to prove to me that you're going to get me through the coronavirus storm. You're, you, you don't need to tell God, prove to me that you're going to get to the financial storm. We should stop making God prove to us he's God and start accepting the fact that he is God. We should start accepting that his promises are true. The word of God is correct and that we can, we can rely on it. But Peter doubted. He doubted and he entered into the storm with doubt. And so what is Jesus going to do? Is he going to lie? No, Peter, it's not me. Don't get out of the boat. I mean, you, he put God in a corner. Do you know how many times people do that in the middle of their storm? They tell God how to deliver them. Here's my plan, God. If it's really you and you're really going to get me out of the storm, tell, do this. And we, we give God like two choices, this one or this one, this one or this one. I don't know how many times somebody has prayed, they've graduated from high school, they're going to university, and they pray and they ask God, should I go to USC or UCLA? Should I go to Berkeley? Should I go to San Diego? Should I? And you give God two choices, but what if God has a different choice completely? How about just saying, God, which school do you want me at? How about saying, God, which avenue do you want to deliver me from this storm? Peter wanted out of the storm, and he told God how to do it. You, have, you, you should leave that up to him. Let him take care of your storm. And so look what happens. It says here, um, Jesus said, what, what else are you going to say? He said, come. And when Peter had come down, listen to this. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. First of all, that's absolutely amazing. Peter has to go over the side of the boat. He has to go down the boat, and he has to step on the water and start walking. I applaud Peter for him walking on water. I applaud that he's doing this. I applaud that he, was, he actually physically walked on water. He found at a moment, the storm doesn't control me. I can navigate right through this storm. How do I navigate through the storm? I'm looking at Jesus. I said, Jesus, if it's you, bid me come. And now he's coming. And now Peter's walking, walking on water. And look what happens. It says, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. He'd already been told, don't be afraid. He was afraid. And, the be and beginning to sink... He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, immediately, there's that amazing word. God acts immediately. He, immediately he has come to you to deliver you through the storm of coronavirus, through the storm of financial hardship. There are so many people who are very concerned about their job. Do I have a job to go to? Am I being laid off or I have been laid off? Do I have any income? How am I going to pay my bills? These are real, true concerns. The answer is Jesus. And the answer isn't telling Jesus how to pay your bills. The answer is believing Jesus will guide you and then you need to start walking when he tells you what to do. And so he told Peter, come. Now, Peter, you're in the middle of the storm. Come, come this way. So Peter starts coming. But then what Peter did is he looked at the waves and he looked at the, the wind resulting through the waves and it says that he began to sink. I don't know how you begin to sink. I actually tried this one time to walk on my swimming pool. You don't begin to sink, you flat sink. <laughs> it, 
And so Peter began to sink. I mean, what happened? Did, did his ankles go under? And did his knees go under? Was he like knee high, still going through the water? And he goes, Lord, help me. And immediately Jesus helped him. He didn't say, oh, Peter, I'm so ashamed of you. Look at you. You didn't do anything. Come on. What do you do? Yeah, go ahead and sink, Peter. He immediately grabbed Peter. And it says in verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? What caused Peter to start sinking was doubting that he was in control of the storm. Peter believed that the storm was now in control of him. Peter looked at all of this as saying, whoa, and here's what happens. When you start looking at the storm and you, in your heart, make the storm bigger than your answer, your answer gets smaller and smaller. That's when Peter started to sink. While he looked at Jesus, he was walking on water. No one besides Jesus has ever walked on water, and Peter is now doing it. They're the only two in history that I know have walked on water. I mean, they've had some people in movies walk on water, but that's all, you know, special effects. But none of them are, are walking on water. And can you imagine stepping on the molecules of water and the water sustain you? I don't know if the water sustained him or he's just walking right there through it. But Peter was headed to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, you will get through every storm in your life if you keep looking to Jesus. As soon as you look at the storm, as soon as you look at the bills and say that they're bigger than Jesus, oh, I just had this come to me. I really feel like this is the Holy Spirit, so listen real close. I think I have a word of knowledge for uh, somebody that's watching right now. The very fact that you're angry at God, that you're under financial pressure, shows you're looking at the storm and not to Jesus. The more you get mad at God, why did so-and-so get sick? Why am I going through this? You're not looking to Jesus. You're looking at the storm. You have to stop looking at the storm and you have to start looking at Jesus. You have to realize that Jesus is bigger than the storm and he has authority over the storm. When Jesus had his personal storm, he went to prayer. When you have a storm, you need to go to prayer. When Jesus was answering Peter's and the disciples' storm, Jesus came on top of the water towards them to help them another this very story in another gospel says this that he would have walked on by them right past their boat if they had not called they had to call on him for help in the you will stay in the storm as long as you don't call on jesus you need to call on jesus and when you call on jesus in the middle of the storm you're going to see how to navigate through that storm there's a couple of things that you want to do to navigate through the storm number one is realize that god is bigger than the storm number two is go to prayer and number three thank god for everything you have thank god for what you do have thank god for what you where you are at Give thanksgiving to the Lord for all that has happened. And as you do that, you're going to navigate through the storm. And Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? When you start looking at the storm being bigger than Jesus, that's when you start doubting. It's not that you, have, you don't have faith. You have faith. God has already given you faith. But it's getting rid of the doubt Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he shall direct your path. Verse 32 says this. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. When they took Jesus into their presence, the wind ceased. Here's what I want you to realize. When you take Jesus into your home, and you ask Jesus to, and you focus on the promises from the word of God, and you focus on the things that God is doing in your life, and that you focus on what the Lord wants to do, and he gives you, starts giving you wisdom, answer, hope comes, and guess what? The storm has no more power over you. It ceases. Well, the coronavirus may not go away. The financial pressure may not go away, but they don't control you anymore. You find yourself being able to sleep. You find yourself being able to think through the plan that God has for you. You find yourself to be creative in, in thinking of things that may have never been thought of before. But I want you to realize, 
I don't care what storm you're in. I don't care what you are going through. God is delivering you from the storm. God wants you to realize that he has authority on, uh, over the storm. That's Jesus walking on the water. And he'll give you authority when he says, come. That's you walking on the water with Peter. You are in control of your destiny. You can call on the storm or you can call on Jesus. The Bible says in the Old Testament, I set before you life, death, blessing, and cursing. You choose. The choice is still yours. And I choose like Joshua did. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We shall not allow the coronavirus to control our minds, our emotions, our heart. Our heart is set on the Lord, and we will exalt him, declare he, that he is God, and he will give us wisdom on how to navigate through the middle of the storm. My friend, you too can navigate through the storm because you are serving Jesus Christ. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen.